Welcome back to another chess game analysis video. Today I want to show you a game between two grandmasters, Igor Kurnosov and Alexander Ustemov. So this is a game that features a very nice opening that was suggested from one of my viewers, FireRage. Thanks to you for uh, giving the inspiration for this very nice opening. So FireRage suggested this um, opening variation under my video from the French Defense. So it features again the Vinovar variation of the French defense, which arises after e4, e5, e6, d4, d5, knight c3 development, bishop b4. And now, as I said in the last video, the idea of the Vinovar is to overpower the knight in order to take on e4. And we've taken a look at in the last video what happens after e5 and then maybe c5, so the game can continue like this. But here, in this variation, you sacrifice the pawn for development. So bishop d2, d takes e4, now you sacrifice the pawn, and now you sacrifice another pawn with queen g4, immediately attacking this pawn, taking this pawn as well, queen, d, queen takes d4. So now we entered a variation that is called French defense, Vinavar variation, finger slip variation, Kunin double gambit. And I like the name because it's so weird, when FireRage commented this under my video, I was like, no way that this actually exists because I've never heard of it and it sounds very weird. But, you know, in chess nowadays, a lot of things are already called theory and this even got a name. So, as you know, I like gambits and here in this position for rapid development, the white gambits, two pawns. And there are a lot of interesting games in the database. I just picked one of the most difficult ones, I think, with the weirdest variations just to show that a lot of complications can arise and even on this grandmaster level there are a lot of inaccuracies i didn't highlight all of them i just highlighted the biggest mistakes and blunders in the game just in order not to complicate it too much so you also get a little bit of an inspiration how to play this but it's not too complicated so in this variation um kurnosov continued with knight f3 Attacking the queen, getting another tempo. You can't take the knight because the queen is pinned. So the pawn is pinned to the queen. If you take the knight, then you lose the queen. So maybe don't take the knight. h5, attacking the queen on the other side. So we have queen f4, getting out of the way. You could technically, this is an interesting variation, also sacrifice the queen on e6. And after the bishop takes, now you can take the queen. The bishop has to move and now for instance knight db5 and you sacrificed one pawn but this is a very nasty position to play for black and the engine also gives huge compensation white is actually down a pawn and still better in this position but queen f4 is maybe the safer way to play this holding the queens on the board giving a little bit more attacking potential in the middle game when you don't trade queens so now white uh, black's queen is under attack so queen d6 going back Queen takes e4, so you win one pawn back. Knight f6, now kicking the queen. Queen h4, bishop takes c3. Now you trade off the bishop for the knight. Bishop takes c3, but quickly, you don't um, allow white to cast long in this variation, at least not now, because now the queen is restricting the white king from castling. Knight bd7, we have bishop d3, development b6 now trying to fianchetto the bishop onto the long diagonal which seems like a good idea in theory but knight d5 attacking this bishop would have been a better move the problem you see in a second white is going to control this diagonal in the end and not black so this was basically weakening the light squares around the queen side we have long castles now the queen and duke are now on the same file, which is not that great of an idea. Queen e7, moving the queen out of this diagonal, of this uh, file. So we have bishop e4, now attacking the rook. This is the problem. Now this light diagonal, uh, light square bishop diagonal has been weakened. So bishop e4, nice move. Now you're basically forced to take with the knight, but now the queen attacks the rook again. This diagonal again weak. The rook a little bit misplaced has to go to b8. Now, with all this maneuvering, this pawn is now um, undefended. And now the bishop takes. Winning back uh, the, the second pawn in this variation and 
the engine actually says white is winning here. The problem is after bishop b7 attacking the queen in between move queen d3, black can't really castle at the moment. The black king is in the middle of the board, this rook already moved, this rook is under attack so it has to move in a few moves. So even though black can't really castle at the moment, he still gets a couple of tempi on the white queen, knight c5, which isn't that great of a move. At this point, you actually need to save the rook, rook g8, attacking the bishop. But knight c5 allows a little bit too much because there are some ideas like queen b5 check and the engine already gives plus 8 because the problem is just the black king simply doesn't get out of the checks and the bishop restricts and you have to block at some point creating even more weaknesses but right in this position play queen d4 which is a little bit in inaccurate but not not the whole advantage is gone yet just a little bit rook g8 bishop f6 attacking the queen queen d6 you see that the variations are very complicated with this advancement like the development lead for white and the black king in the center but somehow Black manages to hold on and doesn't lose material at least yet. Queen h4, now you avoid the queen trade, attack the, the black queen with your rook. Now attacking the white queen with black's rook. You see it goes back and forth, none of the two players actually want to, to uh, move back or just back off and leave the other player room for their pieces to advance. So queen takes h5, this grabs a pawn, queen f4 check, king b1. So black has got some compensation now in a way that now the pieces are kind of active. The, the bishop has a diagonal, this knight is all right, these two pieces are okay. The big problem is just the king, which is still in the center. And if you look at these diagonals, it doesn't seem very likely that the black king can get to safety very soon. So rook g8 now, Bring the rook back because there were some back rank threats here. Queen h7 attacking the rook, rook f8, bishop b5 now attacking the queen, queen g4 saving the queen. Now we have bishop takes c7 grabbing a free pawn, bishop b4 attacking white's queen, queen has to move again. You see how the queens are constantly kicked around because the harmony of the minor pieces and the rooks are very well, is very well in this position. So. Rook c8, kicking the bishop, bishop d7, attacking the rook here. And threatening checkmate actually. If you aren't really, uh, if you aren't careful, there could be checkmate threats here in the in the near future. So we have bishop takes c2 and a bishop sacrifice, which should not be accepted. You can play it very safely. King a1 would be a nice move, and then it could continue with knight d7, knight d5, and you trade off one of the pieces. And in this position, you are up a bishop and clearly winning. This is just one possible variation that could arise after king a1. So the engine in this position gives plus 7. So it's just a straight up piece that black sacrificed that you're not going to get back. And white is better in this position, but in the game, there was king takes c2 so you immediately grab this bishop on c2 which leads to a forced checkmate in six for black you see now the activity of black's pieces is kind of all right and they harm the harmony is there and it's possible to checkmate the white king with queen e4 king c3 if you try king c1 there is a nice knight b3 double checkmate so you have to play king c3, but knight a5, uh, knight a4 check, king b3, queen c2 check, king a2, queen takes b2 check, king takes a4, and now the rook comes in for the kill, rook c4 check, bishop can block, and rook takes b4 check, mate. So, king takes c2, a huge blunder in this position, grabbing the free bishop, which was not free to grab. Interestingly enough, black did see this six move checkmate combination and played instead of queen e4 check actually played queen f5 check which seems like a minor minor uh, difference but it makes actually a huge difference between minus mate in six to plus seven so now the king actually has this d2 square which you can go to and this is the correct way to play 
Rook g8. Now uh, trying to activate the rook and not being checkmated. Bishop takes c5. Now you trade off a piece. Rook takes c5. King e2. Rook, rook c2 check. Rook blocks the check. Now queen b5. King d1. A first and pawn snack. Queen uh, rook takes b2. Black tries to gain back some of the material as you see. Plus three here in the corner. It's a full knight that white is now up. Rook takes b2, queen takes b2, queen c1, queen takes c1, king takes c1. And after the queen to eight, we reach a favorable endgame for white, who has an extra knight and a dangerously passed h-pawn here, which he can push at some point. So, first, black tries to create some counterplay. Black has got some compensation for the piece, but not enough. It's plus three, so you have one pawn for the piece. Which, if everything trades off, you're only left with a pawn against the knight, which is better for black or even drawn. But rook f1, white uh, still has a rook to play with, f6, king d1. This is basically just pushing the pawns forward, so I'm going in a little bit faster. e5, king e1, king f7, activating the king. Rook g1, trying to trade off rooks, which happened. After rook takes g1, knight takes g1, b4, b5, king e2, a5, knight f3, king e6. You need to activate the king in the end game. That's what both players do here very nicely. It's just a question of how to actually convert the knight that you've got for an extra pawn for black into a win. The engine says it's completely winning, but it's not so straightforward because black has got a 2 to 1 majority here and a 2 to 1 majority here. So the only way to actually win this in like a nice way is to push this H pawn. Maybe there are different ways, but white manages to distract the black king and so that the black king has to go for the H pawn here and then grab all the other pawns from black. This is a very nice technique. If you've got an outside pass pawn, you also call this a magnet pawn because the magnet kind of Lewis Black's king to one side, and then you can grab the pawn on the other side. So first, knight d2, there was a fork threat. If you just do nothing now, there is just this fork. And this is drawn. So the knight needs to move out of the way before advancing the pawns. f3, a4, a4, h4. Now the magnet pawn can be pushed. f5, h5, king e6. Now the black king goes to the pawn. King c4, b3, trying to create something. A takes b3, and now you can try to be tricky and advance the pawn, but you can also trade. A takes b3, knight takes b3. <clears throat> King d5, trying to reach the h pawn, which is necessary because otherwise it just promotes. We have King d5 going in and activating the king even further. Now there is one last attempt to draw the game with c 4 And you have to find one move in this position, in this endgame, to actually win with white. All other moves draw. This is why you always need to play until the end. Maybe your opponent makes a mistake. <coughs> f4 is the correct way. It's the only move that wins, not trading the f-pawn. You need it to promote and win the game in the end. So, what happens if you, for instance, trade it off? f takes e4, f takes e4. King takes e4, and now neither the king nor the knight are close enough to protect your h-pawn, which is passed but now alone, and black wins the pawn, and this is a drawn endgame. Though strong grandmasters actually are able, in most cases, to calculate these endgames uh, very nicely because they are quite straightforward, the variations. So he found f4, and now after e3, trying to push the pawn, knight e4, king c7. King e5, king h6, knight takes pawn, king takes h5, and knight, knight takes the other pawn. You are now left with this knight and pawn against king, as opposed to knight and king against king, which was a draw in the in the previous variation. This one is, clo is clearly winning because you just promote the pawn and was in this position that Alexander Ustemov resigned the game. A very nice victory for white with this double pawn sacrifice in the French defense. Maybe 
if you face the winner war and you want to have something sharp and you normally don't like playing against the French, this is what would be an interesting way to play. I've never tried it in my own games, but I will definitely try it on stream. Regarding stream, if you want to see live chess, you can check out my Twitch. You can also check out my Instagram. I would appreciate a follow on both accounts and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye.